citizens taken singly is perhaps inferior in comparison to the best. But the city is made up of many persons, just as a feast to which many contribute is finer, is better, than a single and simple one, and on this account, a crowd also judges many matters better than a single person. Furthermore, what is many, he says, is more incorruptible. Like a greater amount of water, the many is more incorruptible than the few. So he gives there a powerful argument in defense of democracy, like a potluck dinner. Each individual cook may not be as good as the best chef, but many taken together will provide many more dishes and many more uh, variety of, for a variety of tastes than does a single chef. And he says, furthermore, a crowd, the many, is more inc incorruptible than the few. Uh, less light and incorruptible, here I take it in the kind of ordinary sense of the term, le less susceptible to bribery. You can't bribe a lot of people in the way that you can a single individual. Is, are, are Aristotle's views on democracy correct here in his analysis? Uh, do, in fact, many chefs make for a better dinner than a single chef? Uh, well, who, no, no. Would you rather have dinner at the Union League? Where there's one chef, or a master chef? Or would you rather have dinner with a bunch of your friends, each providing <coughs> some piece of the dinner? Well, it's a good argument. It's an interesting argument. It's open to debate at, at any rate. Yet at the same time, is Aristotle is seen defending democracy, providing reasoned and in many ways sensible arguments for democratic regimes. You find him in the same section of the book providing a defense of kingship and the rule of the one. In book three, chapter 16, he considers the case of the king who acts in all things according to his own will. Sounds like a kind of absolute monarch of some kind. This is the part of Aristotle's politics that seems closest, in a way, to the idea of a platonic philosopher king, king who rules without law and rules for the good of all simply on the basis of his own superiority. Aristotle coins a term for this kind of king overall. He calls it the pan basileia, basileia being the Greek word for king, uh, like the name, you know, people have, like the name Basel, ba Basil, Basel, it's the Greek word for king. And uh, pan meaning universal, uh, pan basileia, the, the universal king, the, the king of all. Aristotle does not rule out <coughs> the possibility of such a person uh, emerging, a person of what he calls excessive virtue, almost hyperbolic excellence, he says, who stands so far above the rest as to deserve to be the natural ruler over all. But how, we want to know, does Aristotle reconcile his account of the pan basileia, the king of over all, with his earlier emphasis upon democratic deliberation and shared rule? The citizen, recall, is one who takes turn ruling and being ruled in turn. When readers look at Aristotle's account of kingship, and particularly this notion of the pan basileia, the king overall, this suggestion must at least occur that there is a hidden Alexandrian or Macedonian streak to Aristotle's political thinking that owes more to his native Macedon than to his adopted Athens the idea of universal kingship. Think of Alexander the Great later on. And in fact, in one of my favorite passages in the book, which you will read for next time, uh, I cannot resist quoting already uh, a passage from Book 7, and near the end of the book, Book 7, Chapter 7, where Aristotle writes as follows. He writes, The nations in cold locations in cold locations, particularly in Europe, are filled with spiritedness. There's that platonic word again, thumos, are filled with thumos, but lacking in discursive thought, lacking in the deliberative element, in other words. 
Hence, they remain free because they're thumatic, but they lack political governance. Those in Asia, on the other hand, he writes, thinking probably here of Persia, Egypt, places like Egypt and Persia, have souls endowed with discursive thought, but lack spiritedness, lack thumos. Hence, they remain ruled and enslaved. But then he goes on to say the stock of Greeks share in both, just as it holds, he says, the middle in terms of location. For it, it, that is to say the Greeks, are both spirited, are both thumatic, and endowed with deliberative thought, and hence remain free and governs itself in the best manner. And, he writes, and he concludes, at the same time is capable of ruling all should it obtain a single regime. That these Greeks are capable of ruling all, he says. All, who is all? What does he mean by the all here? The Greeks, the, the rest of the world, uh, should, are, sh are capable of attaining, it seems, a single hegemony, a single regime, uh, are, if in fact circumstances uh, develop. So here is a passage in which Aristotle clearly seems to be pointing to the possibility of a kind of universal monarchy under Greek rule, as a, at least as a, as a possibility. In this passage I read at length uh, is important uh, for a number of reasons. Let me just uh, try to explain. In the first place, it provides us with crucial information about Aristotle's thinking about the relations of impulse and reason, of thumos and reason, as you might say, the determinants of human behavior. Uh, the crucial path term in that passage is this, again, this platonic term, spiritedness, which is both a cause of the human desire to rule and at the same time a cause of our desire to resist the domination of others. It is the unique source of human assertiveness and aggressiveness as well as the source of resistance to the aggression of others. It's a very important psychological concept in understanding politics. And second, the passage tells us something about certain additional factors, extra, in many ways, extra political factors, such as climate and geography, as components uh, in the development of political society. Apparity, apparently, qualities such as thumos and reason thumos and deliberation, are not distributed equally and universally. He says he distinguishes between the peoples of the north, he calls them the Europeans, spirited and warlike, but lacking thumos, those of Persia and Egypt containing highly developed forms of intellectual knowledge, no doubt thinking about the development of things like science and mathematics in Egypt but lacking this quality of thumos, which is so important for self-government, for self-rule. These are, uh, one might think about this, these, these things, he, he says, are at least in part determined by certain kinds of natural or ge geographic and climatic uh, qualities. Uh, a modern reader of this passage uh, that comes to mind is Montesquieu. In, the spirit, in his famous book, The Spirit of the Laws, with his emphasis upon the way in which geography and climate and environment uh, become in part determinants of the kind of political culture and political behavior exhibited uh, by different peoples. And finally, this passage tells us that under the right circumstances, at least Aristotle suggests, the Greeks could exercise a kind of universal rule if they chose. He does not rule out this possibility. Perhaps it testifies to his view that there are different kinds of regimes that may be appropriate to different kinds of situations, to different situations. There is no one-size-fits-all model uh, of political life, but good regimes may come in a variety of forms. There seems to be at least built in 
to Aristotle's account of politics, a certain flexibility, a certain uh, latitude of discretion that in some ca ca passages even seems to border on a kind of relativism. But nevertheless, Aristotle understands that a person, this pan basileia, this person of superlative virtue, is not really to be expected. Politics is really a matter of dealing with less than best circumstances, which is perhaps one reason why Aristotle gives relatively little attention to the uh, structure of the best regime, such a regime which I do want to talk about tomorrow, uh, Wednesday, is something to be wished for, but is not uh, for practical purposes something to which he devotes uh, a great deal of time. Most regimes, and for the most part, will be very imperfect mixtures of the few and the many, the rich and the poor. Most regimes, for the most part, most politics, for the most part, will be struggles between what he calls oligarchies and democracies, ruled by the rich oligarchies, ruled by the poor democracies. In that respect, Aristotle seems to add an economic or sociological category to the fundamentally political categories of few and many. The few are not simply defined quantitatively, but they are defined, as it were, also sociologically, the rich. The poor, again, defined as, uh, the, the many, again, defined by him as the poor. It was not, you have to see when you read these passages, it was not Karl Marx, but rather it was Aristotle who first identified the um, importance of what we would call class struggle in politics. Every regime is in many ways a competition between classes. But where 